Welcome to Living the Smarter Science of Slim, where we provide a scientifically proven lifestyle for long-term health and fat loss by eating more and exercising less, but smarter. Eat smarter, exercise smarter, live better. I am so ready for that. Hey everyone, Jonathan Baylor back with another bonus Smarter Science of Slim podcast. Very, very excited about today's show, but also want to give folks the heads up that we're going to talk about some pretty serious topics, but topics that need to be talked about. And we will be talking about those topics with one of my favorite people in the world, someone who has been in this field for many, many, many decades. I guess I shouldn't say many, too many times, but she is. No, she's please, been... Jonathan, <laughs> not, not more than four times is enough. <laughs> she is a uh, registered nurse at, and is most well known for her foundational work with Dr. Robert Adkins. Back from the very beginning, she was the director of medical education at the Atkins Center for Complementary Medicine in New York City, and she has really been working on the forefront of controlled carbohydrate nutrition since its inception. She is now a consultant working with the Veronica Atkins Personal Foundation for Furthering Education in the Atkins Lifestyle and the Legacy of Dr. Atkins, and today... Jacqueline Eberstein is with us to share some amazing research that is really not talked about regarding uh, gestational health and and what we can do to help prevent and control diabetes and these diseases of uh, carbohydrate intolerance. Jackie, welcome to the show. Oh, hi, Jonathan. Thanks again for having me. It's absolutely Um, my pleasure, Jackie. And I am so excited to talk about this research, because it is so important, and it's not easy to talk about, is it? Well, it isn't because we're going to talk about how being overly fat, both in men and women, by the way, before making babies, impacts that baby and impacts that baby for the rest of their lives. And and it's a touchy subject when you talk about women gaining weight in pregnancy, um, because it, it seems almost like you're picking on them. And pregnancy is difficult enough without talking about what they're eating and how fat they're getting. And and I want to clarify, that's not the reason why I want to talk about this. I think it's, it's an incredibly serious topic um, and doesn't get talked about for many reasons. And one of them may be the issue that it's not politically correct. But it, I think more and more people, both men and women who are at the age where they're making babies, have to have some understanding of the long-term impact. You know, with the issues of obesity that we have now, more and more men or women are overweight or obese, and they're being overweight and obese younger than ever before. Um, And also, they're bigger than ever before. And it really isn't just about cosmetics. It's about so many things, and it's about the legacy they're going to pass on to their offspring. And it's also going to be about can we afford the cost of creating another generation who are going to be very sick very early in life and potentially disabled earlier in life? And I just want, I've, I've been interested in this for now about three years and been collecting data um, about this, hoping at some point I could talk about it. But um, I just don't think it's discussed or people don't even know. I think a lot of it is just absolute ignorance. And doctors don't really talk too much about it because I don't think they actually know what to do about it. Um, So that's kind of what I would like to present today to give everybody out in your audience, whether you're a mom who's raising kids, whether you're a a potential mom or dad, uh, whether you're thinking about having other children, um, whether you're a grandmother and you're concerned about your family and they're not eating well and they're gaining weight and the impact that may have. So I'm just hoping if it gets some people thinking about the seriousness of it, we can start to really do real prevention. Jackie, I so appreciate that. And I appreciate the courage it takes to bring up topics like this. And I would encourage listeners, this is this is not an easy subject to cover, as Jackie's already talked about. And I would urge you, as Jackie's alluded to, to like, this is not about making anyone feel guilty. It's not about making anyone feel bad. Like we're at Smarter Science of Slim podcast. We're going to present you with the science. We're going to present you with the facts. We're going to give you the power to then make the decisions that best work for you and for your family. So we, you know, knowledge is power. I don't want to be trite, but so Jackie's just here to empower us. Let's see it that way. With that, Jackie, let's rock and roll. Let's dig into the data. 
Okay, what, what I want to do is I'm going to be presenting some statistics that I think most of us have been completely unaware of and we have to start taking seriously. And then I'm going to talk some about studies and then talk some about um, the rates of, of C-section in the country, the complications, the risk to mom and baby, how we can try to lower that number, also talk about gestational diabetes, which is on the rise. Um, and we know that any kind of diabetes is going to respond much better to controlling carbohydrates. So that's really one of the solutions uh, that we can present. And then talk a little about breastfeeding and the healthy foods and nutrients we need when moms are pregnant. It isn't about quantity of food, it's about the quality of food so that you can construct a healthy baby. Um, so my, my topic, the title is Making a Healthy Baby, What Future Moms and Dads Need to Know. And we know that we've got this overweight and obesity issue in the country. But it becomes much more problematic when we realize that almost 50% of pregnancies in the United States are unintended. Um, and if, if you're thinking about getting pregnant, you're more likely to think about being healthier before. But if pregnancies are unintended, in all likelihood, um, a lot of people making babies aren't real healthy, even though they may not be acutely sick. They're not healthy. They don't have healthy genes if they're overly fat, and they're going to be passing on those unhealthy genes to their, to their children. So that the health of a child is really going to be determined by the health of the mom and dad at least six months before conception happens. So what I'm really saying is, is that um, those men and women out there who are at the age that they're able to make babies need to start to pay attention to the amount of weight that they're carrying because that's going to impact uh, a pregnancy. There was a, a recent study done at Duke, and most of the studies that are done about uh, the impact of, of, of obesity and pregnancy are on moms. But it's not that the dad doesn't have any responsibility. He, he really does. And there was one study recently uh, presented at Duke where they examined the genes from obese dads and found out that the unhealthy functioning of those genes can impact that child's cancer risk later in the child's life. And I don't think that's something anyone would ever really think about. So dad plays a role here. There's a study in Australia. Now, this one is done on mice and has not yet been done on people. But it, it would stand to reason that uh, it's possible there can be a similar outcome, that the sperm of overweight dads carry molecular signals that can transmit the molecular signals of obesity to their offspring. And, and unfortunately, it seems to impact girls more than boys. But girls do have a more difficult time with weight. Women do because of a lot of things that are different about their physiology, including their hormones. So you really need dads to lose some weight before you make babies. That's basically the message for the dads out there. Um, now, about obese moms, there's been studies done on them and they find that the genes of the fetus from a mom who is carrying too much weight express genes differently, particularly related to brain development. And that's already been shown in the second trimester of a pregnancy. Um, and they're as compared to the gene functioning of women who are at a normal healthy weight in the second trimester. And that then potentially is thought that there may be higher risks of autism, and there's a lot going on there, discussion about obesity, gestational diabetes, and autism, um, and also appetite dysregulation in that child. Um, so we're really programming these kids from actually the first month of conception, because that's when a lot of the neurologic programming is happening in a fetus. And many times women don't even know they're pregnant at that point. Um, th there's also a, a host of birth defects that can happen uh, when a mom is obese. And a, num a number of them are neurological because it happens so early in development to the, to the brain structures. One common one is spina bifida, uh, where the spine doesn't close properly. And depending upon the degree of abnormality, a child could have lifelong disabilities because of that. It's one of the reasons why folic acid is added to certain foods because low levels of folic acid, not only in a pregnant mom, but in a pre-pregnant mom, um, can predispose for the development of spina bifida in, in the baby. 
also other neural tube defects. The neural tube is, is the beginning of the development of the nervous system in a very young fetus. Um, hydrocephalic, that's when the brain head begins to swell because the sp cerebral spinal fluid can't be drained properly. And of course, kidney and heart problems are much more common in kids born to obese mom moms. So are cleft palate and, and cleft lip. Um, the thinking is, is that a number of these defects may be caused by poor diet, as you mentioned, which could lead to an obese mom, diabetes, because of the abnormalities of high blood sugar circulating um, in a developing fetus and high insulin levels, and also because you're missing nutrients, as I've mentioned, the folic acid uh, that could lead to spina bifida. So those are just some of the issues that just obesity can tend to present uh, to mom and baby. And Jackie, the thing that Again, it's, it's this can be like a wave of oh my oh my god, and I, that's not the intent. I think what is exciting, maybe is the wrong word, is to is to think about again if our motivation is just some arbitrary societal like look this way, fit in this size, have this number on the scale. That that that's not a very noble or motivating thing. But if we're here to empower generations. That really keeps us going. So, Jackie, I, I so appreciate this. Let's let's keep going. Okay. Uh, the other point I want to throw out there is is we already know the generation of kids who are here now are developing um, lifestyle related diseases very young. My point in presenting all of this is really we, there are things we can do to decrease the odds of creating a second generation this way, and the impact that will have on our inability to really deliver health care to sick people in the future is is what also motivates me to have this kind of a discussion. So, and I think that a lot of us are unaware, you know, there's this idea the United States has this most advanced health care system. We certainly have a lot of advanced health care technology. Clearly, our delivery system doesn't work for everyone. Um, and I don't think most people realize where we fit in the world with some statistics here. But in the United States, we, we are 50th in maternal mortality rates. There are 49 other countries where moms die, die less often and in smaller numbers than, um, than we do during the process of pregnancy, delivery, and early postpartum. I think that's frightening. I didn't know that until I restart, really started to look into it. And more than half of those maternal deaths can be prevented because a lot of them are lifestyle related. The other issue we have, of course, is that 20% of women between the ages of 20 and 44 have prediabetes. Now, Jonathan, you understand that prediabetes is basically as serious as diabetes and needs to be treated. Yet we have all these young women who probably are unaware that that's what they have. One of the tip-offs is also high triglycerides, and we talk about triglycerides as being a, a, a risk for um, carbohydrate intolerance, a symptom of carbohydrate intolerance. But those women um, who have high triglycerides are also most likely to get gestational diabetes and also most likely to get a complication of obesity and diabetes called preeclampsia, which we can talk about. But we, we've got already a young population that's ill, and, and that those are the people we want to talk to because they don't have to be ill. And Jackie, it's certainly, it, it is a critical time because when, when we see, uh, there's a researcher by the name of, uh, Di I forget her freaking name, she's out of the University of Colorado, and she has a paper on this topic which talks about how when you have one generation and it's struggling with overweight and diabetes, that's one thing. But if then the existence of that generation predisposes their offspring to have the same problem? Like if, if you thought it was hard to avoid obesity and diabetes when you didn't have a genetic predisposition, yeah. Yeah. then it becomes even harder, right? So yeah. like we've got to avoid yeah. that vicious cycle. And, and it's going to become even harder if both parents, when, when the baby is conceived, are sending unhealthy genetic messages to that baby. I, I am convinced that's why we have so many young kids now and teenagers and young people now who are ill because their parents were the beginning of that group who, because of the health messages and diet messages we have been given, started to eat differently. Um, and we've already seen one generation be 
prematurely uh, made sick because of that. And we need to try to prevent the next one from having it happen. Um, so let me get on to the subject of gestational diabetes because that's on the rise, of course, because obesity is, a, is, is one of the reasons why a woman can, be, can get diabetes during pregnancy. And if a number of women are already pre-diabetic before they get pregnant, that's one of the reasons why you see these escalating rates. Um, one thing that happens when a woman becomes pregnant is that she develops more insulin resistance. That's just natural because of the significant hormone changes and the changes that occur in her body. And somewhere around the mid-stage of pregnancy is when women are tested to see if they're developing gestational diabetes. It used to be the numbers were 4 or 5% of every pregnancy led to that, but now we're seeing numbers as high as 18%. The complication you have there is, instead of the diabetes going away once the baby's born, which is what it used to do, that's not happening anymore. Up to 10% of women who get gestational diabetes remain diabetic. And of those women who aren't remaining diabetic, significant number of them in the next few years will become diabetic. And you're talking about women who could be in their late 30s or early 40s, and they're already have type 2 diabetes. So um, it's, it's a really serious issue. Um, another reason why that happens is because women often get pregnant too soon. I mean, the recommendation is you should wait two years between pregnancy so the body can recover and you can lose your pre-pregnant weight. Many times women don't lose their pre-pregnant weight. They're carrying more weight and then they're pregnant again. I can remember working at the Atkins Center and taking uh, pregnancy histories on, on women and they would literally be sitting in my chair crying, saying, I'm sitting here now and they may be in their 40s saying, I'm heavier now than when I was when I went to the hospital to deliver my babies because they never had the opportunity or were unable for whatever reason to, to normalize their weight in between babies. And that's going to increase significant risk for each pregnancy. W what happens is, is that from a, from a healthcare delivery system cost is that gestational diabetes ha has a 34% increase in cost for the mom and the baby's care. Because the baby is at risk in the uterus of a woman with gestational diabetes and in the first days after the baby is born, as the baby's own pancreas tries to adjust to changes in insulin and blood sugar. So these babies have to be watched much more closely. And because of gestational diabetes and obesity, one of the things that often happens is we do C-sections in this country. A third of all births in the United States are by C-section. Um, it shouldn't be any more than 10% of births. We're doing way too many and way too many for a lot of reasons. And there is a risk to mom and baby. Um, normal delivery, yeah, it's very painful and it has its risks. But most people don't realize that C-section can be more risk to mom and baby. Uh, one of the reasons is it's a major operation and women can get blood clots, they can get infection, uh, there can be damage to the bladder or bowel during the surgery. Um, and, and when you have one C-section, many hospitals are unwilling to then allow that woman to deliver normally the next time. So a woman may wind up with three or four C-sections in her lifetime. Um, there's also a risk to the baby um, with a, a C-section. One of the reasons, though, why we do so many is we our babies are too big. It's called macrosomia. Um, as mom's getting too big because of the disturbance of her metabolism and her poor diet, perhaps during pregnancy, the baby is getting bigger. And if the mom gets diabetes, increased insulin affects the baby. It's a fat-making hormone. The blood sugar affects the baby, and babies get bigger and they can't fit. Um, or the mom can suffer significant injuries in trying to deliver a baby that's too big. And can the baby, a lot of times the baby can even get dislocation of the shoulder, trying to fit through the birth canal to be born. And then there's the risk, as I mentioned, of preeclampsia, eclampsia, um, and significant increased costs. The other interesting thing with gestational diabetes is that can be a risk for babies to be born too soon. Um, Normal gestation is considered 38 to 40 weeks. It's really closer to 40. But if a baby is born before 37 weeks, um, then you can have a baby who's not ready to be born, who is going to uh, 
require significant additional care. And in the United States, we have higher rates of preterm birth than 130 other countries. So again, we look at our healthcare system and wonder what are we doing wrong here? Um, and part of what we're doing wrong is we're just not really all taking care of ourselves or each other in order to make healthier babies. The other thing that can happen to babies when they grow up is if you've had a preterm delivery, um, you already are going to be carrying around lower insulin sensitivity, which may very well create a real problem um, later in that adult's life. So, you know, what happens around conception and, and pregnancy and delivery has lifelong implications. And, and that's really the point I'm trying to make. Um, C-section babies have more asthma. They have more obesity. They have more diabetes. The connection to some of that may be because they don't go through, through the mom's birth canal, the, the gastrointestinal tract, which is where most of our immune function happens, isn't matured in the right way. They don't get inoculated by the mother's bacteria in the gut so that the baby's immune system can begin to start to grow and function properly. In a C-section, you're lifted out of your mom's uterus and you have all that maturation of the GI organisms that has to happen and, and that baby is behind schedule. Um, and we're just starting to look at the impact on disease and health with the balance of organisms in the gut. There's, there's so much more over, I think, the next 10, 12, 15 years we're going to learn. But that's already suspected that some of these issues in C-sections um, may be a problem for, for the baby. Um, obese moms um, are likely to have her baby die in the first month uh, or have a stillborn child. I mean, those are serious consequences. Now, I've never known anybody personally with that, but obviously the statistics are there and we have to take them seriously. And what we're also finding is even if a mom is a normal weight and gaining a normal, well, isn't gaining a normal weight, but is a normal weight at the beginning of pregnancy, that more than 52% of women gain too much weight during a pregnancy. There's, there's not this idea of how much we should gain. You're eating for two, supposedly. Well, you're, you're really not needing to eat very much more for two. It's more the nutrients, the protein, the fatty acids, the vitamins, the minerals that the baby needs to be constructed properly and to be healthy when they're born. It isn't the quantity of food or the poor quality of food that the mom needs to eat. And I think a lot of that can lead to cravings. If, if moms were eating a lot of carbs before, I think they're likely to crave a lot um, during a pregnancy and have a lot harder time in managing their weight. There are new guidelines because there's now so many women with so many different levels of obesity that there's new weight guidelines about how much a woman should gain. Uh, a woman of normal weight should not gain more than 25 to 35 pounds. An overweight woman, that's just a woman who's got a biomass index, that's just slightly abnormal, shouldn't gain more than 15 to 25 pounds spread out through the whole 40 weeks of gestation. And an obese woman does not need to gain more than 11 to 20 pounds. And these are fairly new numbers, and I don't know how much people are really aware of those numbers. And part of the difficulty with prenatal care with doctors is they don't have a lot of time to really teach women how to do this. And I think that's part of the difficulty is women just don't have the information they need. You know, start to think about your health even before making babies and get your weight down. One of the important things women can do if you've already had a baby and you've had some issues and you're concerned about the baby having been too big is that breastfeeding provides so many benefits. And the, the um, recommendation now is, is that a baby should be exclusively breastfed for six, the first six months. And then up to a year at least, while you're adding in between six months and a year, while you're adding in um, um, other foods. Because, and the reason is, is because there are different growth patterns between baby's formula fed and baby's Fed. Usually babies formula feed too much. They tend to grow more. They tend to grow faster. Now that's not a good thing. Um, babies who are breastfed have less exposure to insulin-like growth factor and to insulin. So it slows their rate of growth even when they start eating solid food to a more normal rate. Formula-fed babies 
often have increased number of fat cells, which means that they're most likely to carry more weight. And the longer um, breastfed breastfeeding is continued, three to six months, these kids tend to have lower, healthier weights than babies who are formula fed. And one of the one of the important things is, is that, and there's been some discussion about breastfeeding being much healthier for brain development, and there's some recent research that said it is. Um, the fatty acids in breast milk and the cholesterol in breast milk actually can promote better growth of the white matter of the brain. These kids can have somewhat higher IQs. They can have better language skills. Um, so it's important that we get them started, even if maybe during your pregnancy you weren't as healthy as you want it to be. Breastfeeding can make a significant difference. It also protects uh, babies from allergies and asthma, stomach infections, eczema, ear infections, so that these kids are more likely just to be healthier and potentially need less exposure to antibiotics. Uh, when they're when babies. There is less ADHD in kids who are breastfed. There's less obesity, less diabetes. Their gut environment is much different and healthier uh, than in babies who are formula fed. And unfortunately, the marketing of formula companies has wound up making a lot of mothers, particularly a lot of minority mothers, thinking that the formula is healthier than breast milk. And you couldn't be any further from the truth. Um, breastfeeding moms get an advantage is that early breastfeeding right after delivery helps mom recover from delivery and cut down the bleeding from the uterus after birth. Um, they also can help to lose some of their pregnancy weight faster. And there is less risk of premenopausal breast cancer, osteoporosis, and ovarian cancer in moms who breastfeed. So there are benefits there. It's also less expensive. Important foods. Um, I'll go very quickly through these. And, and the foods are normal foods that we should be eating, and they also happen to be low-carb foods. We need choline for brain development. Um, it makes kids be less stressed. If when they were in the uterus, their mom got adequate sources of choline, which is a B-complex factor. Meat, eggs, broccoli are good sources of choline. It may also play a role in decreasing the risk of schizophrenia <clears throat> by getting adequate choline. Folic acid, we already talked about. Good sources of folic acid are leafy greens, avocados, nuts, seeds, and eggs. Um, prevents birth defect, lowers autism, and perhaps schizophrenia risk. Vitamin C before, and um, there's a research um, that was done showing that low levels of vitamin D in mom before pregnancy and during pregnancy can actually decrease brain development of their child, which potentially can mean they have a poorer memory in these kids. And the interesting and sad part is, is that supplementation to these children of vitamin C after birth didn't help improve the problem. And it's important to, to know that smoking can really cause vitamin C deficiency in a woman who's pregnant. So it's important women not smoke. Adequate vitamin D, of course, has been talked about for so many things. You can get vitamin D from fish, egg yolks, cheese. Um, moms who breastfeed don't have adequate vitamin D generally. Most women don't. You really do need to see your doctor, get a blood level done, and, and get supplementation. Um, iron, you can get iron from eggs, red meat, fish, pumpkin seeds. Magnesium is very important. Nuts and seeds, spinach. Sweet potatoes, these are all healthy, whole, low-carb foods. Calcium is important, obviously, to help build a skeleton of the baby, along with magnesium and vitamin D, leafy greens, cheese, salmon, and the omega-3 fatty acids for better brain development, healthier brain development. Um, salmon, nuts, and seeds are, are foods that moms can concentrate on. And they're also foods that will help to control their weight gain, which is what you want to do in pregnancy, and also... Um, not stress blood sugar and insulin. So um, in a quick, what, half hour, sorry, Jonathan, I went over time. <laughs> um, uh, that's what I can tell you. Well, Jackie, and again, I want to salute you for sharing this because the key thing for us, right, is that we have proper information. For example, I, I would imagine mothers in the early 20th century were, were, were just told, yeah, it's fine to smoke you know, during, before and during pregnancy, like it's not a big deal, right? Like smoking, everyone smoked and being around people who smoked, like it's fine. Uh, but when we learned the actual science and that made it to the surface and that cut through the marketing hype and it cut through the corporate 
deception, for lack of better terms, we were properly informed and we could decide accordingly. And I think what you're sharing with us is just showing that just because it's sold in a grocery store and just because there isn't a restriction on the age of people who can buy it doesn't mean that it can't have dramatic, dramatic, on the level of smoking, dramatic effects on our health and the health of generations to come. Is that fair? Oh, I think it's absolutely correct. I, I think that one of the reasons why I think they're starting to be research looking at this is because of the explosion of neurologic issues we now have in the last 20 years, ADD, ADHD, autism, schizophrenia, um, Alzheimer's. Where did some of this come from? Why are we suddenly starting to see all of this? And I think that there are people out there who are looking at it can start as early as the first month of pregnancy, perhaps, the tendency for it. Um, and, and that's the reason why I think this is so important, because so much of it is fixable. And so much of it is in our hands, which is great. Like they yeah, don't, You don't need some pill. You don't need some magic formula. You don't need some personal counselor like these are just decisions and these are you're not you're not also prescribing some sort of crazy way of eating you're just saying focus on these delicious whole natural nutrient rich actual foods and that's that's delicious so that's good which is frankly what moms used to eat exactly you know when when i was in nursing school you, you didn't see what we see now um i, I in the delivery room, I remember seeing one woman with gestational diabetes, and that's because she had didn't have any health care. Um, her baby was stillborn, by the way. But um, you just don't see the rates of what we're seeing now. And, and what's changed is our diet. That's what's changed. Well, Jackie, I so appreciate you, you sharing this information with us. Obviously, a very important subject. Folks, if you want to learn more about this, please do check out Jackie's work. And uh, you find her on the web as Jacqueline Everstein at controlcarb.com. And Jackie, is there a, a place or a resource that covers some of the information we talked about today? Uh, well, actually, not one place. Um, one of the things I and going to do is I plan on writing. I, I, I want to write a big article about family health and about this issue and put it on my site. And so that's something I hope will be there uh, maybe in the next two months. Beautiful. Well, actually, probably yeah. will be up by the time this show yeah. airs. So okay. good news, listeners. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I collected this information from many different places over the last three years. So I'm not aware of any one site who can who can really make it concise and hopefully understandable for people well hopefully your article will do that jackie and that folks will be will be findable at controlcarb.com again jackie thank you so much for joining us today and sharing this critical information with us well thanks jonathan Listeners, I hope you enjoyed today's show as much as I did, although some of it may have been tough to hear. Right. We've just got to get the facts out there and to empower ourselves to make the smartest decisions possible. So thank you so much for joining us. And remember, this week and every week after, eat smarter, exercise smarter, and live better. Chat with you soon. Wait, wait, don't stop listening yet. If you like the podcast and if there's other ways we can help you, please join us in the Smarter Science of Slim support group, which is freely available at the Smarter Science of Slim website, smarterscienceofslim.com. There you'll find all kinds of free recipes and success stories and just all kinds of fun stuff, like how to help your kids go sane and just great community content. And just one last thing before you go, if you wouldn't mind heading over to iTunes and up onto Amazon.com and leaving us a review and then going over to Facebook and liking us, we would hugely appreciate it. 